Hello and welcome uh, to Catholic Family News Weekly Roundup. It's December the 15th, 2022, and I am Brian McCall, the Editor-in-Chief of Catholic Family News. Sorry to report, Matt is still not uh, with us this week. Uh, perhaps you could we could say a, a prayer uh, for his family. They've uh, been battling the... the all the various illnesses that are going around. See, I know a lot of people have have had them, uh, but uh, he he's not able to be with us. But hopefully, he'll be back soon. Uh, but notwithstanding Matt's absence, we will carry on, and uh, we have some great stories uh, lined up for you. Some really interesting developments this week. It was really a uh, busy, busy week. So, first of all, we are going to look at a story that confirms what we told you several weeks ago. The Department of Justice itself will admit that they are, yes, targeting pro-life activists. We'll take a look at that story. Then we're going to look at perhaps Dobbs too. There's an interesting judge who is in uh, suffering the bile from the mainstream fake news right now uh, because he waded into a case related to contraception, but is actually about much more than that. Uh, it's driving them crazy. <laughs> yeah. Third story, uh, there's actually a composite of two stories that came out of Rome this week that I think really epitomize uh, the Francis dictatorship, the usurpation, uh, the tyranny that we are living under. Uh, that, and really, they may seem like a bit of details, but there's two events with the consecration of a bishop and yet another speech that Francis gives to seminarians that I said, I think really epitomize what we're living through. Uh, after that, there's actually an interesting story I want to talk to you about that came on the Tucker Carlson show. Now, I'm not a regular Tucker Carlson listener. I may have heard some of his things, but um, he put forward some information on what's happening at Twitter and what may have been happening that is really pretty plausible. I want to share it with you and give you my thoughts uh, on it. It really may have been an arm of the deep state. Um, and uh, that's really what we have uh, for you this week. But as always, before we dive into these uh, scintillating uh, stories, uh, we will pause a little bit and talk about where we are in the liturgical year. Uh, this week, we are in the midst of the ember days, the winter ember days, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, that the four changes of the season. There are these three days of ancient origin, the ancient church, uh, that are focused on fast and prayer. Um, the, uh, they used to, they no longer, since they abolished them in the new church, but they used to oblige for fasting um, on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday of these four times a year. There was a particular focus on vocations uh, to pray for those studying for the priesthood and to offer sacrifice for them. Yet again, another coincidence, do away with those days of fast and prayer for seminarians and the seminary's empty connection? I don't know. Uh, but beyond that, there is also increased prayer. So you may have noticed if you went to Mass yesterday, uh, there are sort of extra readings. There's uh, some extra epistles. Uh, on Saturday, if you follow the full form, there's, there's actually several epistles. Uh, really very beautiful, beautiful readings. The ones Wednesday were beautiful in preparation for Christmas. Uh, the great prophecies of Isaiah about uh, a virgin shall conceive, his name shall be Emmanuel. Uh, really very, very beautiful. Then Sunday is the fourth Sunday of Advent. I can't believe we're already at the fourth Sunday. And um, this is actually going to be a full Advent. It is a full four weeks because Christmas is on Sunday. So some years, there's there's strange years when uh, Christmas Eve is a Sunday where you go to fourth Sunday of Advent in the morning and you're back midnight that, you know, right before midnight that day for midnight mass. Um, but uh, that's the shortest Advent when it's one day long, the fourth week. This is the longest. So we have a full fourth week next week. So if you're not quite ready for Christmas, <laughs> I'm not, you still have a little time. Um, then we have a lot of ferial days next week, but we do have, uh, well, tomorrow we have the Feast of St. Eusebius, Bishop of the Ancient World. But then on the 21st, next Monday, uh, Wednesday, we have the Feast of St. Thomas the Apostle, doubting Thomas, uh, to whom our Lord said, place your hands in my, yeah, my nail marks and your hand in my side and uh, believe. And he said, blessed are those who do not see yet believe. St. Thomas's rumor is uh, believed, not rumor, really believed from uh, tradition, to have traveled to India, and he brought the faith to India. 
uh, in the early centuries, and he uh, died and martyred, suffered his martyrdom there. So really right before we, we hit the Christmas season, we get this uh, last great martyr apostle, St. Thomas. So that's uh, in store for this week. We'll likely have a news broadcast next, the 22nd, which will be our last one of this year, last one before Christmas. So welcome to everyone who's viewing us a live stream. Hello, Brian uh, O'Neill. Thank you for, for praying for Matt and his family. Hello, Kathy as well. Thank you for noting your, your praying. Uh, it's wonderful to, to see you here. So let's go on to our first story, uh, which I think I've entitled, They Said the Quiet Part Out Loud. Um, and again, this is sort of interesting. There are stories and things we talk about, and they may get poo-pooed by people. Oh, you know, you're reading into things, or that can't be that can't be true. And then it turns out, lo and behold, um, wow, that really was going on. Well, we had a little bit of that um, this week, as we have been reporting uh, very dramatically since the summer. The Department of Justice has been apparently targeting, going after pro-life advocates. Um, we told you the story of one of them. They broke down the door, according to his wife, with guns blazing with his little children there. Uh, you know, Another one, an elderly 80-year-old woman who was a concentration camp survivor was dragged off by the FBI. Unprecedented. We've never seen this many people. Uh, now, again, many people have noted it was after the Dobbs decision overruling Roe v. Wade, but it was also after the scary Philadelphia speech where the resident in chief, Biden, uh, gave that scary speech with the red lights behind him and the armed Marines behind him that you're an enemy of the state. We're coming after you. Uh, again, I, coincidence? I don't know. Um, but we've been reporting there's definitely something changed. And the mainstream media, no, 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 there's no targeting. Well. We now have it confirmed, according to Associate Attorney General Venita Gupta, um, who was delivering remarks at the Justice Department Civil Rights Division 65th anniversary event earlier in December. Gupta described the overturning of Roe v. Wade as a devastating blow to women throughout the country that took away, quote, the constitutional right to abortion. Now, again, let's just stop here. Court did not take away right. They said this right never existed. There was an erroneous legal decision. To be honest, this would be equivalent uh, to someone saying Brown versus Board of Education took away my school's right to discriminate against people on the basis of race. You go say that and see what kind of reception you get, right? Is that what Brown versus Board of Education did? No. It corrected a legal flaw, an error called Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's just one of the more recent ones that I'll point out. So the Supreme Court did not take away a right. They said this right never existed. That court was wrong. They they interpreted the Constitution wrongly. So just a little, you know, again, words matter and ideas matter. But she says, uh, as a result uh, of this um, being happening, Dobbs, the urgency of the DOJ's work including the enforcement of the FACE Act to ensure continued access to uh, lawful access to abort reproductive services, that's our words, abortion, has increased. So she admits it. They've put a new urgency on enforcing this little used FACE Act. Um, and we have that um, by the numbers, you might say. Now, the Justice Department, when pressed on this, said, oh, no, 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 it's not just about abortion clinics. The FACE Act also protects other pro-life pregnancy centers and groups from uh, being harassed. Okay. They, uh, the Justice Department said that when they were questioned by uh, Representative Chip Roy. So let's look at the numbers. 98 Catholic churches and 77 pregnancy resource centers. They are pro-life centers that will help women who are pregnant, who need assistance, not death, uh, and other pro-life organizations have been attacked since May. So far, the Department of Justice has not charged a single person under the FACE Act or any other law with these attacks. Seven, 98 churches, 77 pro-life centers. Meanwhile, the DOJ Civil Rights Division has charged 26 individuals 
who are pro-life activists with, quote, FACE Act violations. So this is, now let don't lie to us. This is not about protecting everybody equally. This is about inequitable justice, just pursuing your political agenda and harassing pro-life people while you just look the other way when churches burn and pro-life centers are bombed. Um, I, it's just disgraceful. But at least they're on record, right? At least they are admitting it and saying, yeah, we are doing it. We stepped it up. Um, this FACE Act basically says you cannot obstruct, stand in the way, bother somebody going into an abortion clinic. And they are, you know, again, interpreting this in an incredibly broad way. Get Compare the churches and the pro-life centers. The, none of these people charged have bombed, firebombed, attacked, harmed anyone. They have been praying, talking to people, trying to persuade people not to have abortions. But unlike the people that are physically blowing up buildings, these people have not done that. They just said they're getting in the way. Somebody might hear them praying on the way into the abortion clinic and change their mind. And that is unacceptable. Well, we now have Miss Gupta's word for it, um, that this is what they're doing. And it's not just Matt and me speculating that, oh, yeah, they're attacking pro-life people. They're after you. They are, by their own words. They have increased the urgency. Um, LifeSite, who reported on this, contacted the Justice Department for comment on Gupta's statements and received no reply. What a surprise. <laughs> so there you have it. It's, it's interesting when they do let the mask drop and they tell you um, what actually uh, is going on. So I mentioned abortion and contraception. So it's, uh, you know, we, we've known all along that they're really one and the same thing. Really, they are very related in terms of moral evils. Uh, they're obviously different. They're distinct, but they are connected. And that you cannot really pursue a pro-life, anti-abortion uh, position and just be, oh, yeah, whatever, with contraception. Because abortion is not only murder in the killing of human life, which it is, but it is also a sin against marriage. It is a sin against the end of marriage uh, because it is unnaturally ending the end of the marital act. So it is it is further, and again, there's even the line between them is very blurred. Many forms of what are so-called contraception work by generating or causing an abortion to occur very early on uh, or make it impossible for the, the young hours old child to survive. So the line between contraception and abortion, even on the matter of murder, is, is you know, a continuum. It's blurred. But even beyond that, the root of the sin, even if the effect of abortion is greater because of the murder, but the root of the sin is the frustration of the natural end of the marriage act. And yes, again, abortion takes it to a level with murder. But if you think about it, contraception is a form of murder because it is, think of God's perspective from eternity. So the soul enters the body and they are killed. But you are preventing a soul that God wants to create. So if that marital act were to end in contraception, God knows which ones will and won't. This contraceptive act stopped it. It murdered, in quotes, right, a soul before. Now, again, the effects are not exactly the same because that soul was not actually created, so they're not dealing with the after consequences, the afterlife consequences of not having been alive here. Um, so yes, it is not exactly the same, but it is a certain kind of murder by preventing this God's creation of the soul. Um, so they are definitely related. Well, the radical liberal news media is up in arms. I just have a Vox story open right now, just by example, are enraged because, and I just want to read their headline because just left the, a notorious Trump judge just fired the first shot against birth control, right? They always have to put in Trump judge because that's their biggest slur, right? He was appointed by Trump, so that's disqualifying in and of itself. And notorious. What's he notorious for? For working for one of the pro bono religious liberty firms before being a judge. Yeah. Okay. In any event, what did he do? This judge, and I, I do apologize to his honor. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. I tried to figure out. It's Matthew Kaksamarik. 
again, I, I apologize uh, for not getting that pronunciation possibly correct. He had a very interesting uh, case in front of him that does relate to contraception, but is even a more broad decision related to the rights of parents to fulfill their duties under the natural law to rear and educate their children. The case is Deanda v. Becerra. Becerra is the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And the case attacks a Title X federal program. Title X is sort of this authorization, the statute that authorizes the Department of Health and Human Services to do this, that offers grants to healthcare providers that fund as this. So there's a, you know, everything's about the money, follow the money. The federal government uses sticks and carrots, and one of their carrots is money. We'll give you money if, and here's the if, um, they provide voluntary and confidential family planning services to patients, including adolescents without their parents' knowledge or consent. And again, family planning services involve not only abortion, but primarily in this program, contraception. So Title X says, doctors, you get this federal money if you will give out contraception to kids without their parents' consent. Now, think about how crazy this is. Your kid can't go in and get stitches without parental consent. Uh, one of our children got a concussion playing rugby, got a call from the hospital emergency room. We want to treat your son. We can't without your consent. Got a concussion, needs help, need my consent. But if that same son went in and wanted immoral contraception, no problem. Here you go. Don't have to call your dad or mom. I mean, think of the insanity of that just on that level, right? Literally, you can't even stitch a head without your parental consent, but you can insert a device into your body that's hard or give you a prescription of pills that can cause proven uh, cancer, ovarian cancer, or that can uh, insert something in your body that can cause cancer without, aside from what it does from a contraceptive point of view, without your parents' consent. So what happened? Um, this father, Mr. DeAnda, who's the plaintiff, sued because he said he's raising each of his daughters in accordance with Christian teaching on matters of sexuality, which requires unmarried children to practice abstinence and refrain from any sexual intercourse until marriage, according to his filing. And this, therefore, is uh, violating his rights as a parent to raise his children properly because it's allow forcing the doctors in his area to do this or lose federal funding. Surprisingly, this judge ruled in the father's favor and struck down the federal program. Now, will it survive on appeal? Who knows? But it's interesting. Now, again, it's interesting that they post this story as an attack against contraception. As you may know, before decades before infamous Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court decided a case, Griswold v. Connecticut. They talked about that a lot at the time of Dobbs. In that case, the Supreme Court struck down a Connecticut law that forbade the selling or advertising of contraceptives in Connecticut. And interestingly, that first case, the Supreme Court said, well, you can't prevent married people from getting contraception. So I thought there was only a slippery slope. Like, oh, if you want to prevent the sale of contraception to minors or people that are not married, that's fine. But you can't prevent married people because of this, quote, right to privacy, which is in the Constitution. Uh, yeah, it's there. Take our word for it, according to Griswold. We can't find it, but it's there. Uh, then they later go, oh, well, if you can't do it to married people, you got to unmarried, and they extend it, and then they eventually get to abortion. So again, people like Clarence Thomas have pointed out in his concurring opinion in Dobbs, this is all related, that these cases all rest on a false premise that there's this bizarre, unwritten, unstated penumbra of rights in the Constitution that are not enumerated that include the right to contraception and abortion. And if abortion falls, he says, shouldn't we be looking at all this? Good point. Now, notwithstanding Vox and these other liberal rags attacking this judge, whose name I can't pronounce properly, um, they're actually even unfair in what he does. Again, the headline, a notorious Trump judge just fired the first shot against birth control. And yes, this does involve birth control. It prevents children from getting birth control without their parents' consent, but it does not attack Griswold. It does not say nobody has a right to birth control. It just says you can't you can't have a law that cuts parents out of their their children's medical 
treatment, anything. You can't take away parental rights to raise their children the way they want. And in a sense, that's even a more important issue. This is a more important case than if it were strike, trying to attack Griswold v. Connecticut. Why? Because we know socialism wants to take away the children. Right? The socialists, the communists knew the only way to win the war is to get kids away from their children, uh, get kids from their parents. The state needs to raise the children so they cannot let the traditional values, the anti-Marxist values be passed on by their parents. That's Hillary Clinton's It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. Remember, the American form of co communism is always a little more subtle. Communism is like, rip the kids away, destroy the family. American communism, Marxism is always a little more, it takes a village to raise a child. Sounds nice. What she's really saying is, it doesn't take a parent to raise a child. The village, the state, has to do it. That is an error. Pope Pius XI, cyclical on education. The children are the primary educators of, the ch of their children. The parents are the primary educators of their children. And the state, he says, has no right to interfere. Now, it's interesting with the church, the church actually has rights towards the children if they are baptized, not the unbaptized. But if children are baptized, they are subject to the church's jurisdiction. The parents are still the primary educator. But if the parents are destroying the faith of their children, the church has certain residual rights to protect the faith of the child. Because remember, the church becomes our new mother, not an addition, not substituting for our natural mother, but she is a mother for us. And so the church actually does have some claim to protect the education of the children. Again, primarily left to the parents in all normal cases. But there is that case the liberals hate as well, where Pope Pius IX did take away within the papal states a baptized Jewish child from his parents because they were taking him away from the faith and provided for his ed Catholic education. The state, however, does not have that residual right because it's only due to the church by virtue of baptism. And so it is against natural law because what, what is natural law? It obligates us to do what we have to do. And what we are obligated to do, the second principle of the natural law is the, the procreation, rearing, and education of children. And the state cannot interfere with that. And that is exactly what this Title X problem does. You can run and run your parents and go break their rules when you're a minor because we're going to pay doctors to do this without your parents' consent. Now, if you get injured from that contraception, you have a hemorrhage, you got to get your parents' consent to be treated, but not to get it. Again, just pointing out the hypocrisy here. So really, kudos to this judge. Uh, I don't know if he's Catholic or Protestant. He's, uh, you know, he, he uh, and kudos to the parent. Again, I don't know if he's Catholic or Protestant, but they at least are entrenched in the natural law. And he said they can't do this. They can't pay doctors to hide this from the, the, the uh, their parents. And again, this Vox article just rips this judge. It just, just goes on and on. I'll read some of the sort of subheadings. His opinion is incompetently drafted, makes several obvious legal errors. And then if you read it, it doesn't actually really explain what those legal errors are. He attempts to weaponize the Constitution against birth control. And like I said, this is really primarily not about birth control. It's about parental rights to raise their children more. I mean, it could have been something other than birth control. Um, that just happens to be this case. But his point really is not focused on birth control. So what happens to Title X now, right? They're all upset. He claims, they say, it violates the Constitution, parenters' right to direct the upbringing of their children. He hasn't yet ordered the federal government to halt the program. His opinion concludes by requiring the parties to submit proposals, laying out just what action he should take to remedy the situation. So again, ironically, they attack him as this crazy lunatic off the, you know, the ranch judge, but he's actually being very reasonable. He's saying, okay, I realize this is not right. This is violating parents' rights. Advise me, what do you think is the, the, the best way to address this? He doesn't just go and impose a solution. He says, I'm willing to listen to the government. What can we do to remedy the legal flaw here in your program rather than just striking down the whole program? Again, pretty reasonable. Say, let's let's be prudent about it. Uh, but no, he's just you know vilified by Vox. And I'm just picking Vox out. There were there are multiple I could have picked. Uh, kind of amazing there. So again, congratulations to them. I hope it holds up on appeal. I'm sure they're going to appeal. I uh, hope it does. But we will see as time goes on. 
Okay, two stories, as I mentioned, that came out of the Vatican just uh, this week. And I saw these. They're sourced from other places, but I did see them uh, on Gloria TV just uh, the other day, their their website. Um, good. I see some more people have joined. Hello. Uh, uh, is that... T T J M Mattingly, nice, nice to uh, see what's going on. Uh, he's he's his family's been a little ill, so he's uh, he's not able to join us again. So, but thank you for for asking, and thank you for everyone who's noting that. Um, what is this? Oh, the Iranians were right when they said the U.S. is the greatest Satan. Uh, probably one of those uh, right for the wrong reasons, <laughs> I could say. Uh, right for the wrong reasons. So anyway, let's turn from Washington, D.C. now to uh, the Vatican for these uh, two interesting stories. So the first one relates to a new Francis appointee. And Francis has really remade the episcopacy. And it gives us, you know, on the natural level, not a lot of hope what comes next, because he has appointed a vast majority of, first of all, he's packed the College of Cardinals with more cardinals than are legally allowed to be there, and appointed the episcopacy. His latest appointment, one of his latest appointments, really epitomizes the modernist conciliar church. Um, and this is Bishop Giuliano Brugnotto, who is 59 years old, uh, and he is from Vicenza in Italia, diocese of 770,000 Catholics, 400 priests. Wow. 770,000 Catholics taken care of by 400 priests. But this is the springtime of the church. Um, and this they source from Faro di Roma. Uh, Italia. So this new bishop, what's interesting about him, there were two things missing from his installation ceremony as bishop. He dispensed with an Episcopal coat of arms and he dispensed with an Episcopal motto. These are for going back for millennia. When you become a bishop, you choose, you are a ruler, you are a monarch of your diocese. And so like monarchs, you choose a motto, a symbol of what you want to accomplish in your term as the ruler of the diocese and a motto that sums up uh, what your goal will be. Uh, what did Brugnato say? He said, ah, I looked into it. I found they weren't obligatory. At least not for a Vatican II bishop, we would add, right? <laughs> not obligatory. Again, this is the minimalist Vatican II. Throw everything out. It's not obligatory. We don't need it. Ah, oh, oh, that's not a defined dogma. It's been believed always and everywhere. Not obligatory. Fasting. You know, we don't have to fast all the time. Let's just change it. It is the minimalist Vatican II. Get rid of everything. The people will love it. Get rid of it. So that's the first epitome of the Francis in Vatican II. Uh, don't move into the papal palace, as Francis has not done. Again, interestingly, we're told Joe Biden lives not often in the White House. There's, he films and does things across the street. The Pope doesn't live in the Vatican. He lives in a hotel. Interesting. Um, he went on to say he considers the coat of arms obsolete because it comes aristocratic and noble families which seems to be something evil for this guy, right? Uh, again, why is the, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with a coat of arms? It's meant to epitomize your vision. So Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, his coat of arms, right? Uh, and his motto epitomized what he was as a bishop. What are the symbols chosen? What do they mean? What, what do you want to emphasize? And this is... And again, it's really interesting because the church has been the most open institution to the rise of whatever social class. Right? It's not like a British closed aristocracy. We've got to, you know, been related back to William the Conqueror. Pope Pius X, classic example, a peasant who rose to the papacy. Pope St. Pius X was a peasant from Italy. Gregory VII, Hildebrand, his name before, he was a peasant. He was mocked by that by some of the, the snobbier people in Europe, rose to the papal throne, did great things. Um, this, the Catholic Church is, again, the most open because it is our Lord Jesus Christ. Your arms are open to all if you do the right thing, if you choose, right? And so it's not, you know, again, this is this ostentate humility. Oh, I don't want a coat of arms. That's, that's you know, too. But, but and you end up not leading. He went on to say he doesn't have an Episcopal motto. This is the best. 
because I didn't know what to choose. There were so many statements I liked. Okay, what's the point of a motto? It's to distill your focus. Obviously, you don't ignore everything else in the Catholic faith, but what's going to be the character of the way you want to lead? Again, I'll refer back to Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. His motto on his papal coat of arms was creditimus in caritate. We have believed in charity. And it so beautifully sums up the life of Archbishop Lefebvre as a bishop, right? It's all about belief. It was about the faith, creditimus. We have believed in charity. So a, he, and again, I think that describes him so perfectly. He was a lion, symbol in the uh, coat of arms, a lion for the faith, unflinching, no budging on the faith. But then all the reports, and if you watch the beautiful documentary that uh, Angelus Press made on his life, and you hear people that still that knew him, people are still alive who knew him in Africa, said he was the most kind, charitable, joyful. It gets amazed that it's quiet, unassuming um, when you meet him personally in charity, right? But when it came to the faith, watch out, right? He was creditimus. He have believed, we have believed in charity. It was a beautiful summary of his whole episcopacy. But this guy can't choose. Right? Vatican II, there's no focus. There is no central one idea. There is nothing that pulls everything together. Ah, oh, you know, I just like everything. I want to dabble in everything. That's the Vatican II. There is nothing there. Why? Because what is the anchor of everything? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Paraphrasing, this is what Archbishop Lefebvre says in his spiritual journey. I'll paraphrase. It is because they, the prelates, do not have our Lord Jesus Christ and his reign as the center of everything they do that we cannot follow them. That's a paraphrase, but it's from his spiritual journey, his last will and testament. That's the sum. That's what it is. Christ is not the glue. He is not the everything. It's what Archbishop Lefebvre said to Cardinal Ratzinger when they were negotiating about the state of the archbishop in his society. And Ratzinger said, ah, let's just strike a deal. Let's just compromise so we can work together. He said, the problem, your eminence, is that you, for you, our, the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ can be compromised, that you can give that up to reconcile with the world. You don't understand for us, the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ is everything. We have nothing without it, and we can't compromise one bit on it. It is the center of all our activity. So how do we work together when you don't care about it anymore and it's our everything to us? Um, that's really kind of interesting, I think, that there is nothing. So what is it? Oh, I like a lot of slogans. I think this poor bishop, probably not his fault, right? I, he, he, 59, he grew up mostly in the post-conciliar church. Uh, I think he thinks of Amato as a slogan r rather than the essence, getting to the heart of something. So it really sums up, I think, the state of these Vatican II bishops um, that have been appointed in France. It just, there's no center. Center is given. It's all just having slogans and not having a central focus. Well, second story is Francis himself. Um, this comes from Germanins, germanabit.blogspot.com. So apparently, Francis met with seminarians from Barcelona, Spain, group of them. Um, and there's a picture. There's a decent amount of them, uh, young seminarians. And uh, there was a speech published on the Vatican website. It was actually quite beautiful. Talked about per perseverance in prayer, the priestly rosary of uh, Bishop Manuel Gazales, which I'm not, must be a Spanish thing I'm not very familiar with, told the seminarians to lose themselves in the tabernacle in moments of pain. Beautiful. Uh, the sad thing is, actually, he never gave the speech. The Vatican published it, but he threw it away. According to this uh, report from the, and coming from the seminarians, he cast the, his speech aside, said he never wrote it, and it was too boring talking about getting lost in the tabernacle is uh, boring. So he said, ah, forget the speech, quiz me. And he just started talking to the seminarians. In the course of this, he told the seminarians that a priest in confession must, quote, forgive everything and give absolution, this is the key, even if the penitent has no intention to make amends. 
a prudent priest who refuses absolution, which is necessary under canon law and church doctrine for a confession to be valid, is, according to Francis, a vehicle for an evil, unjust, and moralistic judgment. So confession is a free giveaway. And in fact, which makes it actually sacrilegious and evil, it's an incitement to more sin. Because think about this. It might be very hard, but to refuse absolution as a priest is painful. But it's also maybe the way to prevent people from committing more sins. If you say, oh, yeah, just absolve you. Here you go. Yeah, go do it again. Just come back. I'm open anytime. You're, you're basically saying there's no big deal with committing the sin. And now, again, the proper balance is the church says, even if you intend not to commit a sin again, if you fall, the door is always open. How many times will you forgive? Seven times 70. Yes, if you're really sorry. But how can you be really sorry if you're not resolved to stop it? Now, again, we're weak and maybe we don't live up to that resolution. But if you don't have the resolution, how can you be sorry? It's like a child commits, you know, does something wrong. They hit their mother. Are you sorry? Yeah. Well, you'll never do it again. Well, I want to do it again. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Well, then you're not really sorry. Now, the child might do it again. They might slip. But to actually say, I'm not going to stop this, you're not really sorry. So how can God absolve you from something for which you're not seeking because you're not really sorry? Um, now, this is interesting because we reported last week on that Jesuit priest who was absolving his um, uh, what's the word? Uh, not a his accessory to a sexual sin. Say, hey, don't worry, commit the sin. And then they went and absolved him in confession, which is a grave sin. Francis remitted his punishment. Why? Because I think Francis sees nothing wrong with that. Just keep committing sins and just keep going through the revolving door of confession without any intention of doing it. And priests that refuse absolution are evil. So he told the seminarians. Francis said there are priests who have fallen into grave sin, but they're with the people. And according to the seminarians, Francis specifically named homosexual and transvestite priests. Now, again, we have been very careful about sins who have fallen in, uh, priests who have fallen into grave sin. They need to be, if they're, they need to be dealt with, they need to be punished. But, you know, you, you, you do have to be compassionate as well. And if they are willing to seek absolution, then God will forgive them as horrible as those sins are. But they may still have punishment. Right? They still have a punishment. If they are convicted of it, they still have to serve their punishment out because sins have consequences. So we're not saying that, you know, you find someone that committed a grave sin against the sixth commandment and they, you know, should be murdered or so i mean that's just ridiculous they are still people they're still and they still uh they have to be punished but you have to have compassion on them that's not what we're saying but what he's saying is these sins are these they're they're these grave sins committed by priests and they should still be with the people well, well no they're committing grave sins that put not only the physical well-being but the spiritual well-being of their flock in danger they can't be with the people they're going to be there committing sins, drawing people into sin. They need to be removed. That's the charitable act. But again, now we see why Francis is not removing, according to Archbishop Vigano, people like McCarrick, people that are committing grave sins. He's keeping them out in the field with the flock because they're doing great work. Maybe they're denouncing climate change. They need to be with the people. This is appalling. Finally, he repeated that the seminarians should not be rigid and clerical. His favorite lines, they would not be good priests just because they dress up as priests. Uh, okay, that's true. You're not just a good priest because you put on a cassock. Granted. But the opposite isn't true. You don't shut You don't find it like this way. Just because you put on a bulletproof helmet as a soldier, doesn't mean you're going to survive the battle. But that doesn't mean you take the bulletproof helmet off because you might it might not work, right? So, yes, you're not a good priest just because you're wearing a cassock, but wearing a cassock is certainly a part, an exterior part that should reflect the interior of wanting to be set apart from the world, dead to the world. That's why cassocks are black. Um, according to the seminarians, in giving him these shocking ideas, Francis used a language which some seminarians described as vulgar, which they say surprised them. How sad. 
Pope St. Pius X in his first encyclical, E Supremi Apostolorum, um, said one of the greatest cares of the bishop should be the careful preparation of seminarians. And here we have his successor going in and scandalizing seminarians by using vulgar language. How sad. St. Pius X, pray for us, is all I can say. But look at this. Look at this. This is Vatican II ideology. No sin is a problem. In fact, they're not even really a sin. In fact, just keep doing it. Again, if you've done something wrong and are sorry, what does our Lord say to the woman caught in adultery? I will not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Not, I will not condemn you, go commit adultery and come back and I'll do it again. Go and sin no more. That's not what Francis told him. He told him the exact opposite. The root of this is really a Lutheran ideology, a Lutheran heresy. Because remember, Lutheranism, we can't, there's nothing we can do. Grace cannot repair our soul. So we commit a sin, we're hopeless. We're perpetually depraved. Grace which we get through baptism that remits sin or through confession, restores our soul. So if we are sorry, we re restores our soul. We're back in good, God's good graces, and we don't have to sin anymore. Now, we might, through weakness, fall, but we don't have to. Grace has repaired our soul. According to Luther, all grace does is throw a cover over us. So we have this horrible, sinful soul. Grace is just like a sheet so that God doesn't have to look at our stinky soul but it's still there. So that's why Luther says, like Francis, sin and sin boldly. Go ahead. Doesn't matter. No hope. Can't change it. So if you're going to sin, you might as well sin boldly as Luther did by engaging in marital acts with a nun. This is really what Francis is telling these seminarians. Tell people to go sin and sin boldly. Just come back, check in with confession and we'll give them the thumbs up. You're great. Because Grace can't change you. Fundamentally, his belief in Amoris Laetitia is, yeah, these are these rules, the Ten Commandments. He admits God made them, but they're just impossible because sin's too, it's just inevitable. It's not inevitable. Even if we do fall, God says it's possible. Through grace, you can. And if we don't even commit to that, there's nowhere to go, right? You've got to at least try to work with God's grace. But grace can keep us from sin. Francis obviously doesn't believe that. We know from Amoris Laetitia and from what he's telling the seminarians. So don't hold back absolution if somebody keeps sinning because too bad. And this is the heart. I'm just going to mention this of an interesting article um, that I saw, The Reinvention of the Catholic Church. And it's in the Atlantic, not a Catholic periodical, but it's a review of an interesting book. And it basically says in this review of the book, um, it starts off, I just want to read the first paragraph. In 2021, time when public gatherings in England were strictly limited because of the um, contagious pandemic, the British tabloids were caught off guard by a stealth celebrity wedding in London, Westminster Cathedral. That's the Catholic Cathedral. The mother church of Roman Catholicism in England and Wales was abruptly closed on a Saturday afternoon. Soon the groom and bride arrive, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Carrie Simmons, a Catholic and a former Conservative Party press officer with whom he had fathered a child the previous year. A priest duly presided over the marriage, despite the fact that the Catholic Church opposes divorce and sex outside of marriage, and that Johnson had been married twice before and had taken up with Simmons before securing a divorce. It was an inadvertently vivid display of the church's efforts to accommodate its teachings to worldly circumstances. Now, I know nothing about Boris Johnson or this lady Simmons. I don't know. Maybe all of their prior marriages were invalid. Maybe he and she converted, went to confession. Maybe he's received. I don't know. Again, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. And therefore, they were able to be validly married. But clearly what this reporter from the Atlantic understands, and I don't know if he heard this from Westminster Cathedral himself, but that no, that's not the case at all. They just said, ah, oh, you're living in sin. Let's just come on in and we'll bless you. 
If that's the case, then that's exactly what Francis is saying to them. This really epitomizes it. And this is exactly the Francis papacy, with even the Atlantic can see. Because they say, in many ways, the Catholic Church is in decline, the article says. But it's not in decline. It's really just re remaking itself, reinventing itself to be acceptable to the modern world. And that's exactly what has been going on with uh, this story, I think, from Francis shows. Okay, let's turn to uh, this interesting video that I want to show you from uh, Tucker Carlson, and that it relates to the ongoing events in Twitter. Um, and I think I reported a little bit last week on the Twitter files, and Musk is unveiling a lot of interesting documents uh, there, ongoing series. But I also reported to you that the, he stopped because Jim Baker, the attorney, was censoring those documents, picking through them, not releasing all of them. And Elon Musk found out he formerly was the general counsel at the FBI. And so he, quote, exited him and then said, wait, we got to look through this and see if he hid stuff. Kind of interesting. Well, Tucker Carlson this week had an interesting observation on some other facts that have come out about Twitter. Um, I'm going to play it for you, then we'll talk about it. Before I do that, I want to just point out one thing you may or may not be familiar with. Elon Musk fired over half of the people that work there. Gone. Thousands of them. Gone. Fired them right away. And he may remember all the liberal news media said, oh, Twitter's going to break. It's going to fall apart. It's because how can you run a company with ha less than half of the workers? They're all gone. It's going to blow up, break down. Right? The wheels are going to come off. And you would think, right, if you had a factory and got rid of half your workers, nothing would get done. Well, it's been a month now. It's working perfectly fine, apparently. No breakdowns, no glitches, zero. So the question is, what were all these people doing? Well, here's interesting information. Trying to staff a social media site. Who would you hire? Well, obviously, since it's a tech business, you would hire tech people, coders, software engineers to keep the place running. Then you'd hired administrative staff because you had to, some lawyers, a caterer, a flack or two, maybe an interior decorator if you wanted HQ to look good. But how many spies would you hire? Well, probably none. Spies have nothing to do with the mission of a social media company. They would not be needed, and you wouldn't hire any opera singers either. Yet, for some reason, Twitter seemed to need an awful lot of spies. The upper ranks of Twitter, we now know, were absolutely loaded with people who once did intel work for government agencies, at least 15 of these people, and possibly many more. Most of them were hired in the wake of Donald Trump's election. Now, what were these people doing all day at what was supposedly a social media company? Well, that's the question, isn't it? We know that James Baker, who came from the FBI, has been accused of secretly censoring incriminating internal files before Elon Musk could release them to the public. Baker was fired for that, so that's some of what James Baker was doing at Twitter. But how about Charles Smith of Twitter's Trust and Safety Department? Smith joined Twitter after working at U.S. Cyber Command. Hmm. Or how about Jeff Tokodger, formerly a director of Naval Counterintelligence? What was he doing? Or Kevin Michalina or Doug Hunt or Mark Jaruzewski or Douglas Turner or Karen Walsh, Russell Handor, Vincent Lucera. All of these people once worked for the FBI as well. Their colleague Jeff Carlton came from the CIA. Patrick Conlon once worked at the NSA, and so on. And it wasn't just American intel officers who found a home at Twitter. The company hired foreign spies, too. In January, Peter Zatko was fired from his position as Twitter's head of security. Reportedly, Zatko lost his job because he complained about the level of control that foreign intelligence agencies had over virtually all of Twitter's operations. According to Zatko, there were operatives on Twitter's payroll from other governments, including China and India, and they had access to private user data. And those are just the details that we know about. Elon Musk was asked recently how many former FBI agents are currently employed by Twitter, but he wouldn't say. It's all pretty weird. It's all pretty weird. I agree. Now, and it's a lot of really interesting information and sort of begs the question, well, answers the question, why is the platform still working with half the workers gone? Because they weren't actually working for Twitter. <laughs> they weren't doing anything. Why, if you worked as a spy for the FBI or the CIA or the NSA, would you get a job at Twitter? Well, Tucker Carlson speculates, and I'm going to add to that. So I'm going to mix now some paraphrases of his speculation on why they might have been there and my own. 
So number one, if you were, what are the two things these agencies want to do? Intelligence agencies want to control the narrative. They want to spread false information to manipulate the world. That's what they do, right? That's one of the jobs the CIA is to, to do that. What better way to do it than get on the bullhorn of Twitter that everybody reads? Number two, they love information. They want to get private information. So as Tucker Carlson explains, part of Twitter has a back end. It's called direct messaging. It's where if you don't want to post something publicly, you can just directly send like an email or a text to other users if they're open to it, and then they can send back to you. And Twitter says it's private and encrypted. Well, it definitely has been suggested by Elon Musk since his takeover that it may not be public, but it's certainly not protected, that Twitter employees could read it. So if you wanted to gather information as a spy, it would be like getting access to everybody's email accounts or text accounts. Treasure trove of information. Third one is interesting. All of these people joined Twitter, this big staff up of spies, after the election of Donald Trump. Now, whatever you think of Donald Trump, what he did or didn't do, he at least publicly said he was going to clean the swamp. He was going to get rid of the deep state actors. So what do swamp creatures do when they're being hunted? They hide. What does any prey do? They hide. So where do you hide in the FBI? Nowhere to hide. So what do you do? Go somewhere where Donald Trump can't fire you and keep doing your job. Now, again, this is speculation. But think about it. The deep state controllers. Okay, some of us are going to stay behind. Some of you are going to go out in the field. We're going to get you, quote, jobs at Twitter where you can do surveillance work, control the narrative loosely under our direction, but not officially. So Donald Trump can't fire you. Then you can hang out until we get rid of him. I, again, I'm not saying that happened, but what were they doing there? Why were they there and why did they all go after 2016? Now, if there's this many at Twitter, how do we know how many are at Apple, Google, YouTube, Facebook? We know some at Facebook. There's been some evidence of that. It's all, as he said, really weird. Really weird. Um, Again, I don't know what to make of Elon Musk. He's certainly, I don't think, on our side, per se, but he's doing something. Um, I don't know if you saw recently somebody attacked a car that his young child was driving in. Okay, he's a strange guy. His kid's name is X. Okay, still, he's a kid. Um, somebody jumped on the car in a mask. Not a COVID mask. Ski mask or something, I think. Um, he's clearly rattled some cages. Is he exposing an arm of the deep state of the Orwellian Ministry of Truth that was operating in plain sight? It's interesting. I'm not, I'm speculating like, like Tucker Carlson did, but it was a little clip. Again, I don't watch him all that often, but it was something really intriguing that I think was worth sharing with you. Um, don't, don't doubt that the church, the deep church, has their own same apparatus. Um, I've heard it from traditional mass communities. Oh, that's the diocesan spy. They're here to spy on. They're here to listen to what the sermon is. Don't kid yourself that the deep church doesn't use intelligence officers. Um, again, we don't need paranoid. We don't need to be looking over our shoulder. We just need to be aware. And I take it as a good sign these things are coming out. Because right before a regime crumbles, things usually come into the open. They get exposed. Can be step one of the crumbling deep state and deep church. Well, enough speculation, enough thoughts on that. Thank you to all who joined, who are listening in the live stream, and who will watch this in uh, video format uh, later. Um, Ah, by the way, here's a quick comment uh, from one of our listeners. Look up InQtel, all big tech is staffed. And again, by CIA and NSA, I, I don't have particular proof of that. I'm not sure this thing you're referring to, but again, we have proof of Twitter. If it's happening there, I'm sure it's happening. Uh, yeah, here's another one, Wikipedia, I'm sure. 
um, I'm sure. Again, it is just ego. Why would you hire 15 top executives who are former spies? Thank you for your comments. And thank you for listening. And if you've enjoyed this program, please help us by sharing the video, subscribing to our channels, making us more well-known. We really have no budget. So you are our marketing department. So please help us with that. And as always, consider a subscription to our weekly newspaper, which you can get electronically or sent in the news and the mails. Uh, but uh, it's only $32 a month electronically, $42 to get it delivered. And even if you get it delivered, you do get electronic access, which includes not only the current month, but archives going back multiple years. So please consider that to help us with our apostolate to reach more people. So let us pray. Remember the Gaspers family particularly as we pray and turn all of these stories, these concerns, these worlds around us, the world around us to Our Lady. Again, we don't need to be in despair. We don't need to be upset about it. We need to be informed because Catholics, we need to use our mind to be alert. But we don't need, because the vector of victory is already won. She has crushed his head, his head with her heel. We're just playing out this act. And we need to see what's going on in the act. But the victory will come. We know it. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. So we don't need to be worried in any sense. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Saint Eusebius, pray for us. Saint Thomas the Apostle, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful fourth Sunday of Advent, and I look forward to seeing you for our last program of the year, hopefully with Matt back next week. Thank you.